Hello humans, it's just Martine, and today we're reading the second half of Kingdom Keepers 3 because I couldn't handle all of my thoughts and put them into one single video. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, then you might be watching the wrong video. I'll put the right video for you to start with right there. Basically, I'm reading my favorite series over again and I'm in the middle of book three but I had to split it into two chunks because I had too many thoughts and feelings. Let's keep this introduction short and jump into it. So remember in my last video how I said to make note of the fact that when they crossed over this final time in this book, Charlene is wearing her nightgown again. Later in this video you will see contradiction saying that Charlene is not in her nightgown. Do not believe it. Remember at the beginning of chapter 27 we got proof that she crossed over in her same usual cotton nightgown. All right. So now I present to you things Charlene does in a nightgown that just makes sense. First is climbing upside down on that thing wherein she asks them if they'd ever done uneven parallel bars. Right now she's vaulting over shrubs. We're off to a great start. Vaulting over a bench just as she ran hurdles for the track team. Leaped onto the edge of the fountain and across the water, landing a foot on the retaining wall, springing off it, and ducking under a tree. Now she's vaulting over a second wall, all sorts of running. Vault without a follow through. Rides mission space. Climbing up a door like Spider-Man and flipping over it, kicking a troll, barefoot, high jumping over trolls, diving and sliding into the elevator like you're sliding into third base. Imagine being in a nightgown and holding yourself in the top of an elevator, hoping that the person doesn't look up and see you, but I'm hoping the person doesn't look up and see something else. <laughs> Additionally, this girl just vaulted not one, but two fences and ran through sprinklers. She is now soaking wet in a white nightgown. And once again, she's not going to be damp for the rest of the, not Charlene scaling the whole phantasmic superstructure, climbing up a ladder with pirate chain around her shoulders. Kicked by a dragon, swung around on a chain, throwing a javelin, swimming through the chilly water north of Epcot's China, in a canal, in a nightgown, in a nightgown, and in a nightgown, 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 while in a nightgown. This nightgown should not survive the night. We're picking up on page 273. Charlene just asked Willa and Jess if they'd ever, she was like, you've done uneven parallel bars, right? And I was like, what a gymnast thing to say. No, why would they have done uneven parallel bars? Yet another one of my favorite Maybach lines ever about why can't we be normal kids? Philippi is like, because our parents wanted the college funds that Disney is paying us. And Maybach's line goes, college funds don't do you any good if you aren't alive to go to college. <laughs> they never mentioned Jess being able to speak French before this moment, but it's really her knowing the French word for hum for me when I learned it from this book and my mom's first language was French. Also, she knows the French word for fluorescent lights. Why? What teacher is teaching you that, ma'am? They're in the waiting room for the Impressions of France video and I have a very specific memory there from one of my trips to Epcot with my family. It was really warm. It was like mid-afternoon and so the sun was out to play and I believe it was in the summer too. So it was hot and we were walking to Impressions of France and suddenly we saw the band Forever In Your Mind and also Peyton List from the Disney Channel walking by with cameras following them, like clearly for a Disney Channel thing. And, but it was so hot out that my sister and I were both like, did we, were they actually there or did we like, hallucinate that. As I suspected a few moments ago, but did not say, Willa had to swim to get away from the barge. And she is quote unquote on page 291, drenched head to toe. Later in the book, like one of the last chapters, some of them are going to swim in the water, that same water, and it's going to be freezing. It is the dead of night right now. She is drenched from head to toe, but does she get hypothermia? No. Is it ever mentioned again? No, so like Willa, drenched, soaked through, Charlene in a nightgown, Maybach about to be like ripped at by a polar bear. None of these things will be brought back in the future. They're just going to continue as normal 
as if none of this has happened. The true sign that Maybeck and Charlene are made for each other in this series is that only a few pages after she vaults over a ton of stuff, Maybeck vaults over a ton of stuff too. Later in the book, all the parents and guardians will find out that like they're in the syndrome, except Mrs. Nash because she's oblivious. They're going to freak out, but they should really be like more freaked out than that because in like the first couple chapters of the book, Finn swims in water and then gets cut by a sword. And then there's a mixture of water and blood all over his sheets. Maybeck should have blood on his sheets and Willa should have water all over hers. But will any of that happen? No. But that would be a lot more concerning. <laughs> when there's a clue about a fly and Maybeck says, SWAT? Like a SWAT team maybe? <laughs> Charlene says her parents listen to the band U2 all the time. But like, do they listen to it separately? Cause they're divorced. Just saying. Spot on character work that a sarcastic guy like Maybeck would love the satire of The Simpsons. Finn's mom wakes up basically in a cold sweat being like, the code wasn't about a competition, it was about Wayne. I was like, didn't you already figure that out earlier when you were like, I looked it up and there's no competition? I feel like in this book, the characters figure something out and then they just pretend to figure it out again. Like I understand that you need this scene in order for Finn's mom to wake up and find out that he's stuck in the syndrome so that you can have like lots of things happen later that are disastrous, but if you're going to be inconsistent, like just don't. It has always bothered me that on Soren they sit on the third row so as to avoid being seen and it says that it will bring them like back in the room, but actually when the mechanism moves up, like the third one is the closest to the ground, like it's the lowest and probably the easiest to see. Again, I am not crazy that I thought all of them had Converse because Willa is wearing Converse on page 326 of book three. So last book we got Amanda and this book we got Maybeck and Willa all wearing Converse. Finn's still in his keens. Also, Willa's Converse would be wet from her swim. And she's gonna leave a puddle behind in this. She's soaking wet. I know you're trying to be sneaky, but going at a full out run in Converse on like pavement like the flooring that they have at Soren will make noise like a lot of it. Finn is behind I was about to say Finn is behinding. Finn is behind a fast pass kiosk and may I just say RIP fast passes like fast pass kiosks instead of having them on your phone because now there are never any good fast passes left and there's nowhere for Finn Whitman to hide. Page 330 to 331 just has one of my favorite conversations ever because you just learn something about the Kingdom Keepers lives that like is totally unrelated but Finn's carrying a sword around and he He's like, this is so heavy, it's like carrying around a tuba. And Philby's like, you played tuba? And he's like, I did for like two weeks in fifth grade. Finn's tiny, tiny with a tuba in fifth grade. And then he switched to trumpet. Philby, meanwhile, plays clarinet and sings in his church choir. And I love that for him. I really do. This is why, like, this is evidence of why I have the headcanon that Philby is like an amazing singer. I have so many like visions in my head sometimes when I listen to songs about like where Philby would sing this song or like, songs he'd sing to Willa and stuff, and it's just, this is why, because he sings in his church choir. It's just crazy, because I read this book for the first time, and actually the first couple of times probably, before I ever went on mission space as a ride. It's the Maybeck referring to Willa as Willow Tree for me. The one thing out of this whole series probably that Ridley Pearson keeps consistent is that Jess is like, very intelligent, but it's not discussed often. First she leaves all these clues for them in the second book, just like, brilliant, like a whole anagram. Her brain just does this. But then, in this one, she knows like everything there is to know about IMAX projectors. And Willa's like, what, are you channeling Philby or something? And I'm like, no, this is Jess. She's going to go to Edgewater High with you in high school, specifically for the like smart kids program. She's brilliant, we love Jess. On page 340, it refers to what Maleficent, like the fireballs Maleficent makes as St. Elmo's fire. And I had literally never heard of that before. I don't know how many times I've read that. And I've never, like I've never read that. And I looked it up, and um, I guess you learn something new every day. I mean, I guess, but like, random to include in a kid's book. Finn is like reveling in the fact that Philby doesn't know this one thing. He's like, the three words, I don't know, they never come out of Philby's mouth. They taste so sweet. And I'm like, bro, your life depends on him knowing these things. You better hope he does know. What? Philby uses this sword in this book way more than Finn does. Finn is basically just carrying it around and then he loses it during Fantasmic later. Now he literally throws it at Philby and Philby catches it. Philby is a legend, a legend. 
and an expert swordsman. Okay, Maybach jumps into the like mission space pod as the door is closing and he loses a shoe. Like he has to yank his shoe off. And I was like, I really hope that I don't flip to the page where they say what every kingdom keeper is missing after this whole sequence of scenes occurs on all the different rides. And they say that Maybach doesn't have a shoe because the way that mission space is set up and the way that this scene, like this set of scenes works for Maybach is that like he's in the pod and then like he leaves the pod. His shoe should be right there and he should put it back on. Just put your shoe back on. So I was like, I'm too curious. I can't wait. I flipped ahead to the beginning of chapter 34, page 386. And it says that Maybach was missing a shoe. I can't. I, your shoe is right there. You don't know. You don't need to be without it. Your shoe, there's, it didn't go anywhere. It just came off your foot for a second. Just pick it up and put it on. That's all you need to do. Maybach's famous line about being flat as a pancake and about to lose his cookies. And that makes pancakes and cookies. And that's not pretty it's everything there's not real any conversation about interest between Maybeck and Charlene in the first couple books like it doesn't come until much later in the series and they're both surprised by it but I would argue that they have top tier banter now as it is because the whole scene in mission space is just them saltly throwing remarks back and forth to each other he's like who put you in charge? And she's like, you did. I love it. I love them. If Ridley Pearson is to be believed about the order of the chapters, then Finn's mom found out that Finn was crossed over and thus stuck in the syndrome at about 11 p.m. Then that would be about when they started going to all these attractions. And I know I'm not there yet, but I once again skipped ahead because I can't wait. And they get back together at 3 a.m. I swear. These things did not take four hours for them to do. They just didn't. And yet, okay, am I just dumb? I know that every time they like become all clear, there's like this tingling sensation, right? But then it's the description here that gets me thinking. It said, he felt his legs twitch and jump with static, like his nerves misfiring just before sleep. Blah, 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 blah. He felt nothing but an, the intense tingling in his limbs and a fullness in his heart. So is the tingling that Ridley Pearson always talks about when they become all clear, is that just the feeling of falling asleep? Like, is that all it's supposed to be? Because here's my thing. I tried, there were like several years of my life where to fall asleep, I would like meditate. It taught me the sensation of like actually falling asleep in a way that just like laying there until you fall asleep doesn't. And I had never before considered that that specific feeling, that set of feelings is what going all clear would feel like. And that changes my perspective like entirely on going all clear. How did I miss that? Later, it will say that Amanda had to rescue Maybach and Charlene from the mission space pod, except they had no way of reaching her to let her know they were in trouble. Like they tried to call her and they didn't have service. And also the pod just opens on its own, probably wait and programming something into it after his message. So that literally can't be the case. And again, Maybach's shoe is just, is right there. When he leaves that pod, which opens itself, his shoe will be there, just put it on. These people working on Soren, they know you're there. You've just run away from them and you've left the building. Maybe they won't chase you, I understand that. But aren't they at least gonna call security to be like, yo, there are kids in the park. But they don't, they don't do that. They're never mentioned again. You run away and they're like, oh well, I guess we missed them. I'm sure everything will be fine. <laughs> Philby tells Finn to give him his shoes. And Finn's like, it's a weird time to be locked in fashion envy. Let me say, Finn, no one has fashion envy of you. No one does. It's Finn Whitman. So like, how good looking are the boots? Probably not the best. Philby has four running shoes strung together. He's trying to like throw it. It doesn't work. So instead he lassos it above his brings it down with the deafness of a golf pro. So like, boom, that was more baseball. But you, you, you understand what I, he brought it down really hard. That's, that's all it's trying to say. And then the car stops and Finn grabs Philby by the belt. And this has always been my favorite thing that McLeod Andrews has ever done in the audiobook. As Philby lifted off his feet, both hands over his head, ready to fly to his death. That's how he says it. First of all, isn't he holding a string of shoes? <laughs> but it's just, boom, he's, he's ready to die. Finn grabs his belt and he's like, not today. I need to stay alive. You do too. Brilliant. Okay, so here's the state of the Kingdom Keepers at 3 a.m. Charlene is in a nightgown 
This presumably means she has been shoeless the whole night and additionally sockless. Maybeck is missing a shoe. He shouldn't be, but he is. Will is missing a sock. That's not too dire. Finn and Philby no longer have shoes. So we have three kingdom keepers who have no shoes on in the slightest bit. And because it's poorly written and things are inconsistent, we are at three and a half kingdom keepers without shoes at all. The places they will go for the rest of the night without shoes on, bold. Finn will be on the phantasmic stage in what? Socks? And we're not going to mention it. Willa should be soaking wet as well. That should also be happening. So, all in all, they're a wreck. Oh, and Finn is heckin' sunburned on his face and his hair is like burnt. And Maybeck still has the Polar bear scratches. They're a disaster. They are in worse shape than Ridley Pearson knows. <laughs> the Kingdom Keepers are almost constantly struggling with the concept that one of them is betraying the rest of them, and I just want to know what would happen if they played among us. I am going to now read this scene, but switch out all the words that imply that it has anything to do with the current plot, and instead make it seem like they're playing among us. Basically, they're all like, I think we should do this, and Willa, Willa disagrees, and then they all look at her. So she would say, hey, now wait a minute, enough with those looks. We've got to get something straight. Just because you may disagree doesn't mean you're the imposter. You should see how you're all looking at me. What if I'm the one voice of reason in all this, huh? What if I'm right and Philby's the one killing all of us when we're not looking? Then they all turn to Philby. He goes, nice try. She says, I'm not trying anything except to make me out to be the imposter. I'm just asking, are we safe for doing this or not? And I think the answer is pretty obvious. And Maybeck agrees. He goes, Willa has a point. We need to stay paired up at all times. If there's an imposter, we can't allow him or her the chance to kill anyone else. And then he suggests like a group to leave. And Charlene's like, I hate to point this out, but whoever the imposter is, he or she would love nothing more to, than to see these three specific people killed. Um, so everybody turns their suspicions on to Maybeck. And then Amanda is like, guys, quit it. Just skip the vote, basically. Skip, skip the vote. We're not throwing anyone out right now. That's how this scene would happen in Among Us. Thank you. Terry Maybeck, I rest my case. I am the man. Why does Philby refer to the evil queen as the wicked queen? Is that just a typo? We're just going to casually notice that it is past 4 a.m. when they get to Wonders of Life for the second time. Several chapters will go by, all of, all of which will occur in this like one sequence, but it's still quite a long sequence. And then it will be around 5 a.m. They're doing run-throughs of Phantasmic at 5 a.m. He has to be there by five. Theoretically, if they wanted to actually hitch the ride they're going to hitch in chapter 38, they should be doing it in chapter 36. If only you hadn't spent four hours doing something that definitely didn't take four hours, then your timeline might work. Incredible. Half of these fools were waiting in a jungle in their socks. Sometimes I hate girls, Maybeck said. All the talking. The boys do most of the talking in this book. Does Maybeck literally ever mention that he's scared of heights? I don't think so. And then Philby is like, you're not gonna like my plan. And Maybeck's like, oh yeah, why not? And Philby's like, because it involves heights. And Maybeck's like, you got me there. I always forget that Charlene has three cats because in my mind, it's just her and her mom and that's it. Her, her mom and three cats. Lots of cats. None of these people have dogs, but Philby has Elvis who is my favorite Kingdom Keepers pet, may I just say? But Charlene has three cats. I hate cats. Cat people are gonna come for me in the comments now. Whatever. I wanna know a couple things. Where is Charlene keeping her phone when she's wearing her nightgown? Another iconic Maybach line. You be patient if you want to. I don't exactly feel so patient. Finn says something that Maybach thinks is sappy. The only thing Maybach can think to say is, sorry, I forgot my violin at home. Cue the sad violin music. Philby's tightrope walking, which <laughs> is one of my favorite parts of this book, to be honest, but <laughs> I hadn't like tracked everything really up until now with like the whole shoe situation. So I'm just gonna say it. First of all, Finn should have been slipping and sliding all over the place on the like aluminum plank he was crossing because he's wearing socks. And Maybeck, I hope he either put on his shoe that was right there in the first place, which we all know he didn't, or he took off the other shoe to be even because or else he's just wearing one shoe doing all this weird climbing. But it makes sense that Philby would tightrope without shoes on. However, it does not make sense to tightrope 
with socks on. So that was an interesting choice, but we all know Ridley Pearson did not realize Philby was wearing socks. He doesn't even remember that they're not wearing shoes, I'm pretty sure, so. <laughs> Philby figuring stuff out while tight roping, chef's kiss. All of them running through the jungle, shoeless, well, maybe I cast one shoe, but with socks on, less chef's kiss. He looks at his watch and it is 4.24 a.m. Plenty of time to catch a ride from Pete, but it is past four when you go to Wonders. You make it all the way back across the park to the Nemo Lounge afterwards, and that whole thing takes way longer than you anticipate that it would anyway. I promise you, you missed your ride. First, you've got the wrong day. You're just there on the wrong day, straight up. You think you're there on the right day, it's the wrong day. Now it's the wrong time. I hope it was daylight savings time or something, because it would not be 424. <laughs> I think this is my first time fully like physically rereading this book since I got to take a backstage tour at Epcot. And so them talking about like the costume facility and stuff like I've been there, that's so cool. I know what this looks like. <laughs> This conversation between security. You think too much, one says. The other says, we're supposed to think, you jerk. How are we supposed to keep this place safe if you're not thinking? And the other says, you're trying to trick me. Just by asking me that, you're making me think. I know your type. The nameless what? Finn says, jump. And somebody, we will never know who, says, what? <laughs> Amanda and Jess do not have phones. We can all agree that Amanda and Jess do not have phones. It said, Many times they have to email the Kingdom Keepers. It's inconvenient. That's the point. And now suddenly Amanda has Wanda's phone number, but she didn't have it in her phone's contact list, it said. And then Philby just had it memorized and nobody knows how he learned it in the first place. <laughs> what? I have never once registered that it says that Amanda has a phone on page 441. She does not. So you're saying that these aren't tech rehearsals at all. They're more like exorcisms. No, that is not what he is saying. <laughs> right, so I just thought of this. If Finn has the sword with him and the sword is real, which we know, because he, he couldn't catch it when he threw it to Philby and also they took it off a ride on this night. So the sword is real. So tell me, when they were in DHI shadow in the truck bed and the security guard lifted the tarp, why was the sword not there? Did Finn jump out of the back of a truck and roll with a sword attached to his waist? Finn is like finally growing into his leadership position. He like grabs the sword and he's like, I can do this, right? And then Philby's like assignments and Finn's inner monologue makes this whole to-do about the fact that in the beginning they were all jockeying for control and now they just expect him to have a plan. And I'm like, they have never done that. They have literally always turned to you for a plan, literally always. So we go, from one of my least favorite Finn inner monologue leadership moments in this book to my favorite, which is that he says that he thinks Wayne chose him because he knew the value of the other kingdom keepers. He knew when to ask for help and how to get the help that he needed from them. He knew what everyone's expertise was and he wasn't afraid to use their expertise. And I love that view on leadership. Like that is the one thing about Finn that I've kept with me in my life. That is the one thing about Finn I don't dislike is that particular view on leadership that he voices in this third book. Well, doesn't voice, but you know what I mean. And there have been so many times when people have asked me like what makes effective leadership, like in essay questions or stuff for interviews, all that jazz, I always use this definition of leadership, of knowing the value of your team members. And it works every time. It's a great definition. I'm gonna give him that. It's a great way to look at leadership, but that's the only good thing I'll say about Finn Whitman. <laughs> Philby says ordinance. And then Willa says, that's fireworks. And it's directly targeted at Amanda for literally no reason. If anybody needs anything, it's Willa. She's our wild card. I've been called worse for Willa. The inconsistency of Maybach's first name, like whether they use the stage name or his real first name, is so inconsistent that in the same paragraph, Mrs. Whitman calls him two different things. She said, you heard what Bess Morton, Donnie's aunt said about Donnie, blah, 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 blah. Terrence just woke up at some point. <laughs> but also, Aunt Jelly's last name is Morton, not Maybeck, so she's got to be related to Maybeck's mother. 
nice. There are two types of smart people in this world. There are people who are smart, but they are humble and they are kind. And there are people who are smart and they use that to think that they're better than other people. And Mrs. Whitman and Mrs. Philby are different kinds of smart people. Mrs. Whitman is literally a rocket scientist, but like Mrs. Philby, Gladys Philby, ugly name by the way, and we never learned Finn's mom's first name, point aside. Gladys Philby <laughs> thinks that she is superior to Aunt Jelly because Aunt Jelly is an artist. We'll just pretend that's actually why she dislikes her, but two types of smart people. Additionally, it always weirds me out when they call Philby's parents like Mr. and Mrs. Philby because I'm so used to just referring to him as Philby, like to the point I know his first name is Dell, right? But like, I never think about the fact that it's his last name. Same thing with Maybeck usually. Like that's just what we call them all the time. We rarely refer to them as Del Philby and like Terry Maybeck or Donnie Maybeck, or whatever you want to call him in the same paragraph twice. But it's just interesting because like, although I know those are their names, like their last names feel more <laughs> like their names because they're used more often. And with Maybeck, you don't really have to be tripped out by it because his parents aren't around. But with Philby, his parents are around and so they're called the Philbies and it's weird to have plural Philbies in my opinion. One of the only things McLeod Andrews has ever done wrong in narrating this book when they talk about platform nine and three quarters he calls it platform nine and three fourths. So anyway yeah that's frustrating. In slow motion I am going to recreate how Charlene finds DHI shadow or that she proves it's there. Ready? So she's running and then she stops jumps and starts running back. Like Mater from Cars. Charlene says, would you have said that if Philby had been the one to discover it? I think you need to open your mind, Finn Whitman. And I've never agreed with Charlene more in my life. DHI Shadow continues to baffle me. Amanda's new at this, so maybe she can't touch stuff while invisible. Why would that be the case? Literally, why would that be the case? What if I go down there into projection shadow and the sword doesn't come with me? Finn asks, and I have to say, I had that same question when you switched which park you were in completely. Foreshadowing about the importance of Mickey Mouse. Amanda gets so sad when he calls Charlene half monkey, as if that would be a compliment. Ridley Pearson really thinks that boys do sports and Xbox and girls figure out who likes who. Because that's the extent of our hobbies. I don't know about you, but my hobby is ripping this book to shreds. Finn and Amanda just can't communicate, and that's one of the reasons that I don't really care for Amanda. No offense to anybody who loves them, but they just literally don't have one good conversation. It has always bothered me that on page 475, they refer to it as Everest Expedition, but it turns out they don't here, so I don't know if like McLeod Andrews read that wrong or like the first printing of this book had that typo. I'm, I don't know what it is. Finn like hides the sword because it's like, it can't just go floating around in the stage area, but like, how does it get to the stage then? What? Color me confused. They seem to have such fancy smartphones. Sorry for the piano playing. On page 477, it says that Philby pulls out the Nextel, like a Nextel phone. Shout out to Philby for being able to take keys on and off rings when I cannot. <laughs> Come through, Willa. Come through. Philby knows how to use music composition and video editing software. Cannot wait for him to launch his YouTube channel. Charlene calling herself a Yahoo cheerleader. Gladys not a hawaiian house dress over a nightgown no shout out to mr frank philby gladys is one thing but frank is another a strange feeling as if an animal had crawled inside of her and were looking for a way out <laughs> r.i.p to philby having the iv in his arm and literally losing his mind but I do appreciate this line here about drugs and alcohol on uh, Philby's behalf because it's exactly how I've always felt. And this is why Philby and I see eye to eye. He said his parents had lectured him about drugs and about drinking alcohol. He had no interest in either. Drugs and drinking messed up your mind and Philby valued his mind far too much to go experimenting with its chemistry. Same. Big same. Imagine seeing Philby sitting in an office chair in the pyrotechnics booth of Fantasmic, laughing hysterically, bouncing up and down to Disney music. <laughs> I feel like Jess's reaction to Maleficent, like Maleficent realizes it's her when it's too late to do anything about it. And she's like, you, and Jess goes, me, enjoy the show. And I'm just like, I can see her pressing the button and like winking at Maleficent as she goes up like, you, me, 
Bye bye now. <laughs> Clout is a word that should not be in the Kingdom Keeper series, but it is on page 503. Page 504, Finn had the sword. He put it down and he never picked it up backstage. He does not have the sword. It is the wrong day. It is the wrong time. You do not have the sword. You are going to fail. Keep the count going from Kingdom Keepers 2. Maleficent once again said, you know what happens to children who play with fire. It says, quote, Finn was going to get flamed. Part of me realizes that they're talking about a dragon spitting fire at him. But the other part of me is like, the narrator right before I start talking about Finn. Imagine, if you would, that you're a Disney cast member running Fantasmic at five in the morning, like a tech rehearsal. You've done this all week long. And suddenly this morning, things are shaping up to be a little different. You make it through the opening, everything's fine. Then suddenly, when Maleficent comes on stage, the cues are not acting right. The cauldron stays there. And suddenly, there is a child on stage. A child. A child. No. Then. You have fireballs thrown at you. Okay, so you can't intercede. There are lasers involved. The dragon appears. That's normal. Then the witch on stage transforms into a vulture. The child is rescued by another child who uses air to retrieve the sword from the laser cage. The first child then slices the neck of the vulture bird witch. Then an old man appears on stage, followed by the dragon getting ready to throw flames. But then... The dragon falls over. The fire hits the old man. The trap doors open. The fairy slash witch falls through them. The child is still on stage. And another child appears at the top of the structure in a nightgown watching the dragon as it falls. It's clearly her that made the dragon fall. And you're just going to let the children leave after this? You're just going to let them go back to where they came from? No questions asked. Just a normal day at Fantasmic. Maybe we were all dreaming. It's pretty early in the morning. Steve hasn't had his coffee. Count the number of times Wayne either appears to or does die in this series. I dare you. They're all very sad because they think Wayne is dead right now, but we must not forget that they sat on each other's laps in Wanda's car to get back to Epcot. And I would like to know who sits on whose lap. I just want, I'm curious. I'm curious, like does, does Finn sit on Maybeck's lap? Is that the vibe we're going for? Is it more like Amanda sitting on Finn's lap? We never find out, but I would love to know. Sometimes you need to be brave enough to say the things that people think you shouldn't say. Like they'll be saying, Wayne was the traitor after they all think he's dead. Risky, but smart and brave. I will never not appreciate Maybeck telling Philby that he is tripping. Then he says Philby is way overbaked. Help me. What do you see? A nervous finger behind the finger. Earlier in the book, it says that Philby has an advanced understanding of chemistry, but like, wow, does he prove it when he takes a sniff of the sweatshirt and he's like, that's cordite. They're like, Willa, how did you get out of there? And she's like, I swam. Yeah. You swam, but you suddenly dried off. We never saw you not dry off. Your shoes should be soaking wet. Wet converse, those will not dry. Also, it says that Finn, Amanda, and Charlene are the three best swimmers of the group, but literally, later in the series, Willa basically saves one of those three, either Finn or Charlene, it's one of them, from practically drowning because she is a lifeguard, certified lifeguard. <laughs> Ridley Pearson is going to straight up deny that Charlene is wearing a nightgown on page 534. Slowly crawling on her belly down the far side of the barge, keeping herself flat and low, her wet black clothing blending in perfectly with the barge's black paint. This girl is wearing a white nightgown. I showed you the proof. I'm fed up with this. Tell me why Finn's mom says that she's going to go with Maybeck's Aunt Bess, so Aunt Jelly, to Epcot to look for the kids and when the adults arrive at Epcot and the kids see them, it is only Finn's mom, Finn's dad, Philby's mom, and Philby's dad, and no Aunt Jelly. That is not correct. School was school. Boring. And then a few pages later, Finn says, an interestingly profound thing followed almost immediately by one of the cheesiest lines of the whole series. Ready? He goes, just because you're good at something doesn't mean it has to own you. Brilliant. And then he says, let me put it this way. You can push me away all you want, but I'm like a human yo-yo. I'm going to come right back at you. Amanda says that her family is not with her because she pushed them away. But girl, aren't they dead? 
Like, I thought we established that. Here, Finn says it directly. You're Kingdom Keepers now, you and Jess, except for the rest of the series, you're gonna say the Kingdom Keepers and Jess and Amanda, the Kingdom Keepers and the Fairleys, they're separate entities. <laughs> the rest of the series, but they're not. They're all Kingdom Keepers. I just finished the book, so... Here are my thoughts briefly to wrap them up because this video is probably already plenty long. Kingdom Keepers 3, I don't think anything could take away its position as my all-time favorite book. I think I've just been reading it for too many years for that to be a thing. There are clearly many, many issues and frustrations, direct contradictions, uncomfortable conversations that are handled incorrectly, all of that stuff. But above it all, this is where the series really takes off. This is when we get to see my favorite park, we get to see more of my favorite characters, get to see the group grow and finally include the fairies as kingdom keepers. We get to see lots of really cool things from like phantasmic to more of the DHI like process when they make Jess and Amanda into holograms, all that stuff. We get introduced to new characters, new plot lines, etc. Super cool. I think it's hard to put into words what specifically this book and this series has done for my life and for me as a person. But rereading it is always like a trip, like physically rereading it. Cause again, I listen to it like every night and I swear, like there were so many things that I mentioned to you in this video and the first one on Kingdom Keepers 3 that I had never noticed before. And that is not a new thing. More than anything, every single time I read any part of this or listen to any part of it on audiobook, I hear something or read something I've never seen before there, <laughs> which is cool and interesting and makes it fun. So I hope you liked part two of Kingdom Keepers 3. If you did, go ahead and give it a big thumbs up and comment down below. Are you excited for the next part in the series when I read Kingdom Keepers 4? Do you like the series? What are your opinions on my flaming of Finn women, if you will? What are your thoughts on Kingdom Keepers 3 if you have them? And if not, let me know how you're doing. I respond all of my comments. So chat with me down below and subscribe for more reading, writing, and college lifestyle content on Wednesdays and Sundays. And until next time, bye humans, bye!